And what God is, has always been trying to get to with us is he wants us to go beyond uh, surface values. He wants us to go beyond just learning how to act a certain way and behave a certain way. And what he's trying to do is show us that he wants much more than that. He wants a, he wants to transform us. He wants to renovate us. He wants to, to reconstruct us. And the only way that he can do that is by coming into us. And from within, he changes us into a different person. We're the, still the same person. We'll become a renovated, uh, much better version of what we are. I think that God wants us to be who we are. He doesn't want you to be a different person. I think we, we have a tendency to really look down upon ourselves or be critical of ourselves or try to compensate for our insecurities by, by being maybe uh, the opposite. You know, egotistical or arrogant or critical or, or uh, you know, a, a know-it-all. But what God is really trying to do is show us how to rest in Him, how to live our Christian lives organically and naturally through the Holy Spirit of God, guided by the Word of God. And that's why it's necessary to study the Word of God. It's, it's constantly in our face to study to show yourself approved. And we need to know what God thinks about everything, what He feels about everything, what He has done from the beginning of time, what He's going to do at the end of time. These are all within our reach if we would just study the Word. But you can't understand the Word without being it being illuminated or... Uh, or, or brought to a place of revelation by the way of the Holy Spirit. So I know a lot of people that have studied the Bible their whole lives and they don't know anything about God. Because they study it and they only see it through carnal eyes. The carnal mind can't discern or understand spiritual things and therefore you have to have a spiritual mind in order to understand spiritual things. So they work in conjunction and, and in unison with one another. They, without the Holy Spirit, without the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the teaching of the Holy Spirit and the empowering of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit living within you, you can never obtain what you need to obtain through the Word or, or for that matter, through, through any uh, part of your Christian life. And so when we look at this concept of the law versus grace or the law versus God's promises or the law versus a relationship with God, you have to see that it expands much more beyond like a, a judicial system. It goes much uh, more beyond even the, uh, the course of uh, salvation. It has to do with our whole relationship and, and how we behave or how we relate to God and how we see God. And then that relates to everything else you do in your whole life. Because if you're a legalistic person, you may achieve a lot of things in this world that you're always going to be dead inside. You'll be as dead as the law is dead. Not that the law is, is not living to God, but it is, it is death to us because we can't obey it. We can't change ourselves with it. But what changes us is when we yield ourselves to the truth of God. So Paul had written in, in verse 18 of this uh, same chapter, chapter Galatians chapter 3, he said, For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. We were talking about the relationship with Abraham and God, how Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Abraham was seen as a righteous man. Why? Not because he did all the right things or behaved correctly, because he had no law to, think, to, to follow, but because he believed God. It doesn't say that he believed in God. It said that he believed God. So anything that God would say, he would just go, okay, I believe you. If God told him to do something, he'd go, okay, I'll do that. And we see the greatest example of that is when God told him to take his only son, who he had waited for uh, for almost 100 years. And he had, he had waited his entire life to have an heir. And finally, Isaac is born, and then God says, I want you to take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. And this is really kind of the kind of relationship that God wants with us. He doesn't want us to have this, this kind of distant relationship with him, where we can't really speak to him as if he's someone that we know. He wants us to know him and to be able to relate to him with reverence, and I think it's wise to be reverent and, and have a healthy fear of God, but he wants you to be real with him. 
doesn't want you to just go, well, you know, uh, try to hide things from God or try to manipulate your relationship with God because he sees you, he knows you, he loved you enough even while you were yet just an unworthy person to send his only son into the world to die for your sins. How much more does he love you now that you are his child? And now you are a child of the most high God. Not when you get to heaven, but right now, this night, as a believer, you are a child of the most high God. Paul is speaking about the, the difference between a relationship with God as Abraham had, where he believed God, and he did what God uh, would command him to do because he believed God, he trusted God, he relied on God. And even though he was not a perfect man, and you see through the scriptures, he was a conniver, he was a liar. Uh, in fact, all the heroes of the Bible were just as defective as we are. And that's why the Bible's great. You don't see superheroes that are perfect, only Jesus was perfect. Every other great man and woman of God was seriously flawed. You know, they were they, they were bigger sinners than most of us. They committed horrendous acts that would have been uh, something that would cause them to spiral into, into hell. But because they believed God, because they had a relationship with God, it was accounted to them as righteousness. So way before the law was ever delivered to the children of Israel, God had this standing with man that if they would believe, if he, he would believe God, if they, he would walk with God, then they would become righteous. Why? Because they would be in the presence of God. They would be in the presence of God, under the authority of God, under the friendship of God, all of, all of the above. This means that you can't have the inheritance of God both ways. Either it is given to you because of the law, which means because you've been such a righteous person, or it is given to you because the promise, uh, because of the promise made to Abraham and his seed, Jesus Christ. One way ends with a curse, and the other to eternal life. And if this is true, then why was the law, which would surely bring a curse to us, given to us at all? God knew that when He delivered that law, that no man on earth could ever live up to it. So it's almost like if you don't you look at it correctly, you can see God as like one of these, uh, like a Roman god or like a, a Greek god who sits up in the heavens and just goes, oh, what should we do with Hercules today? Oh, let's feed him to a hydra. Let's feed him to a dragon. Let's have him get beat up over here. You know, and just kind of play with us like we're little pawns on the earth. And that's not the way it is at all. God always had a plan in restoring man back to himself. Before man ever fell, he knew that man would fall. Before Lucifer ever exalted himself and was cast out of heaven, he knew Lucifer would do what he would do. There's nothing out of the sight of God. And so knowing that, we have the first thing we have to swallow is why, you know, is, is to be able to see what God is doing and trust him regardless of what you think about. It. Because we can't fathom the reasonings behind what God does and why he does them. So you learn to trust in God. You learn to rely on God. You need to you learn to believe God, just like Abraham believed God, and it's accounted to you for righteousness. You become a righteous person through belief in God and what He says. And the chief thing that He wants you to believe is that it is only begotten Son. To, to look at Jesus, look at my Son, behold my Son. And as you look upon Him and you see His perfect life, you see the way that He was born and, and the way that. Uh, he was allowed to be born to, to uh, poor parents and go through all the, ter the trouble that his parents went through. You, you have to remember, this is a man who grew up with everyone always thinking that he was like a uh, illegitimate child. Think about that. He, he was raised in Galilee, where everyone thought that Mary had gotten pregnant by someone else. I have a horrible reputation for things I've never done. And I can prove all, prove my innocence, but it doesn't matter because people want to think ill of us, or if they want to think ill of us, they're going to. I mean, we do deserve some of it, and a lot of it we don't deserve. Jesus was the most righteous man and the only perfect man to walk the planet. The people, even the scribes and Pharisees, when they saw him, made insinuations about that particular thing. That, well, well at least we had fathers. Yes. At least we we were born, we know who our fathers are. They were saying you are you are a illegitimate child. Your mother was was a adulterer, and yet she was a holy woman. And Jesus was the most holy man. 
So then you look at that. That's the picture that we see. We see Jesus born. All of time is based around this man. It's almost 2015 years since the date of what the way we celebrate his birth. Every religion in the world, all uh, agnostics and atheists have to bow to the fact that all things surround this one man. You know, it's, it's absurd. It's ridiculous. How can one man only be in public for three years and be the center of all of our time? Well, they say, well, because Constantine and the Christians, and they grabbed all and they made the calendar. No, God did that. God established his son and showed who his son was, even if people didn't want to believe. And it was all for the purpose of what we're talking about here. So that we would understand that we can never be holy enough. And he showed us what holiness is by establishing the law. We would look at the law and go, okay, this is what righteousness is. I'm going to try my best to be this. But your best is never good enough. Because if you've ever committed one sin at one moment in your life, you are guilty of being eternally separated from God. Because you can't make up for that sin. You can't atone for that sin. You can't erase that sin. So what do we do with all the sin? The only thing that we can do is either try to live according to the law and live righteous according to the law and still go go to hell because you're still separate, separated from God or you find a way to be cleansed. And that's what this is all about. So some of the wordage in this is, is difficult to, to understand, but, but I'll cap it all as we go. It says in verse 19, what purpose then does the law serve? If it's true that... The only way to the kingdom of heaven is through the promise made to Abraham about his seed, Jesus Christ. If this is true, then why was the law? Which would surely bring a curse to us, given it all. In verse 19, Paul asks this question outside. He said, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression. Till the seed, singular, Seed, singular, not, not plural, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. He says, Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confirmed all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. That's a handful right there. This is what this means. The purpose of the law was to make known to man his transgressions. Transgression is what? It's a violation of the law. It's a violation of a commandment or, or our duty before God. It is the exceeding of due boundaries or limitations that God has placed upon man. And we breach these. That's what a transgression is. Therefore, the first purpose of the law was to reveal to man, first to the Jews, and then to the rest of us, our shortcomings, our, our guilt, our failure when comparing ourselves to the righteousness of God, the righteous statue, stature of God. The law was given to show <coughs> him the selfishness of his nature and actions. For how could you know that you were in violation of a law unless there's a law that's stated? Or how would you break a commandment unless there is a commandment given to break? What is required by God concerning us? What is God's view of what's right or wrong? How far have we wandered away from God? This is the purpose of making known to God his transgression. And if you break the law, even if you don't know the law, you're still going to suffer the consequences of the law. And we know that. Ignorance of the law, even on, on, the, on the state level or city level or county level, uh, it's like all the all the laws that are set in place, we have to obey even if we don't know them. And we will suffer the consequences of those laws even if we don't believe in them. I could say to a cop, well, I don't believe in the, the, the speed limit. I, I don't think that's fair. 
I want to go faster. Or I want to go slower. I want to, I want to be able to go down a one-way street because it's a shortcut. It makes sense to me. But they'll still give me a ticket or they'll throw me in jail. It's the same way before God. We can say, well, I don't believe that God said that. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in your God. I believe in my own God. My, God, my own God says I can do all the things that you say that your God says you can't do. And I know the truth of the matter is, is that there's only one God, and he's the one that establishes all the lines and the stoplights and the rules. And if we break them, there are penalties for these things. And these are all written out in the law of God. They're all delivered to the children of Israel for us to see. Primarily the, the, the Ten Commandments and all the things that the Ten Commandments represent, but also the other uh, laws that were uh, brought to clarify the commandments, those Ten Commandments, all the other things that fit beneath them. Secondly, the law was given to declare the penalty of committing transgression. It showed man that if he decided that he was going to disobey the directives of God, then there would be penalties for that disobedience. And God set forth the penalties. So he sets his law, he sets his penalties up. Number three, it was given to set man upon a proper course. So even if you didn't want to, if you didn't agree with the laws of the land, you could obey them to know which direction you should be going in, down what street, down what alley, uh, you know, green lights mean go, red lights mean stop, yellow means rush them, you know, drive <laughs> through them, you know, whatever it, whatever it is. It was given to set man upon the right course. And so when you think about the law, even someone that doesn't believe in God or believe in the law can see what direction God is going in. We still blow it. We fail. We fail miserably a lot of times because we still walk in this flesh, which is always in opposition to the things that God wants to do for the most part. And then we have adversary, the devil, and all his minions that are invisible, that are everywhere, that are like more numerous than all the mosquitoes in Florida, it's like they are around you, enticing you and suggesting to you that you do certain things which cause you to transgress God's law. So we're in a dilemma. Our dilemma is if we are obeying the law or trying to obey the law, we are already defeated. We've already been defeated. Even if you're going uh, on that right course. But it was to show man the guidelines which must be met in order to be in good standing before God. It acted as a motivator. A, a, a push in the right direction. And now if you decided to go another way or direction, you would be now aware that you were going against God's direction. Therefore, the law was added to point man to the direction of God. And lastly, fourth point was the law was given to convince man of his need for redemption. When you know that you've broken a law or that you're going to break a law, no matter how hard you try, and you know what the penalty is for, uh, what the penalty is for the transgression or the breach of that, in this case, death and eternal separation from God, the next thing that you would logically try to do is find a way out of having to pay the ultimate penalty. So what does man do? He tries to behave well. Well, I've, I've committed all these sins, so I'm going to do all this good. Like you see this even among celebrities today. They, they're, they're partying, they're committing adultery, they're uh, messing people over and stepping on people's heads to try to get to the top, and then they start giving to charity. But So you try to alleviate your guilt by doing good. You try to outweigh your good by, by uh, your bad deeds and put weight on your good deeds so that when God uh, puts all your sins on one side of the scale and all the good deeds on the other, hopefully your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds and you're going to happen. So the law was given to us to show us that we need a savior. We need a redeemer. We need to be rescued from this plight of the transgressions that we have done against the law of God. Because all of us have breached the law of God. And that's what Paul is saying is that we've already seen in scripture that, that all of us are filthy. All of us are dirty. All of us have sinned. All of us are stained. So now what do we do? We either ignore God and say, well, I don't believe in you, and I don't believe that I'm going to go to hell. I don't believe that you're ever going to judge me. I don't believe that the sky's going to open up and I'm going to see Jesus. I just don't want to believe. So you start leaning more to, towards psychology and philosophy or other religions that say that you're just going to be reincarnated a zillion times until you become a perfect God being yourself. You, you, you listen to all this stuff trying to alleviate what the inevitable holds for you. 
eternity is separated from God, eternal damnation and punishment, because you would fight against and and and, uh, and resist the holy God who created you. So what do we do? This sets the stage for the Savior. And to me, the Savior, if you look at him in modern times, he's a hero who comes to your rescue. The seed, the descendant, the heir, promised by God to Abraham, comes to your rescue. Not to the rescue of mankind, to your individual rescue. Here's the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The last part of verse 19, it says that it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. And there's nothing in the Bible which gives an account of angels having anything to do with the giving of the law. But it was a common opinion among the Jews, and Paul must have believed it too, that the law was given by the instrumentality. The angels had something to do with carrying the messages of the law, uh, and, then, and, and those things were arranged by them. And the angels were thought of as being the agents who delivered the law to, uh, to Moses. And Moses was the mediator so to speak. In this case, Moses being the mediator between God and the, and the nation of Israel to whom the law was given. So it says in verse 20, now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. You would be confused, but if you read it in context, this verse could have many meanings. However, I believe that what Paul is getting at is that a mediator who mediates always mediates between two parties. And it's usually a, a mediation only occurs when there's a disagreement, when there's a breach, when there's a transgression, when someone disagrees with what the other person is doing. A mediator can't mediate with just one party. You can't just go to one person and try to mediate the other person. That's, that's what you call just a showdown. But Moses mediated between God and Israel, bringing them the law and then making intercession for them before God. The children of Israel were always breaching the law and God would, would want to destroy them and Moses would go and plead with God. And, and God knew what he was going to do already. It wasn't like Moses could even change the mind of God. But it was set up that way so that we could see what it takes and what it would take for God to withdraw his righteous indignation from a world full of sinners. Instead of flooding us again and destroying all of mankind, what did he do? He rescued us through his only begotten son, who became a permanent mediator, who was always standing between uh, the wrath of God and us because he took it upon himself. So anyone that believes in him, that receives what he did for them, also gets that free ticket if they can be given to heaven. Not by anything that you would ever do, anything you would ever earn. It, it, it takes no effort on your part at all, but just to receive the pardon, to receive the enemy of your sins. So where does this leave anyone else who isn't of Israel? Where does this leave the Gentile nations? It leaves them with no one to mediate for them. Yet Paul says God is one. This is what this means. Signifying that God is the only one who can mediate for all, both Jew and Gentile alike. So here you have Moses, and he is this great mediator between Israel and God, but how about the rest of us? But God is one. And there's only one God, and that God is the one who mediates for us. Mediates for us so that we cannot be held accountable for our sins, because he held himself accountable for our sins and put himself into our place. So Moses only mediated between God and Israel. God was the one who gave the promise to Abraham. Therefore, God is the only one who also can mediate for all of us in that he is the only one. Uh, he, it is only he who can promise us, as he promised Abraham, the blessing of salvation. We are given to it. We are given <coughs> salvation freely. We are given a pardon freely. So it says in verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? The Mosaic law, if it, if it is such a, a dark subject because no one can obey it, is it against the promises of God? And he says, certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, that men could have obeyed, that they, he could have been perfect enough to obey, truly righteousness would have been by the law. 
if it were possible for the law to give life, it could have given life, and righteousness could have come by obeying the law, but the promise was that no one could obey the law, and everyone ended up sinning against God through the law. But the scripture in verse 22 has confirmed all under sin. If you read through the scriptures, there's no escape clause. <laughs> We're guilty. Every one of us is guilty. Even the best of us in this room, the best human being on the earth, the, a baby born into, into the world without having done any sin physically is still a sinner. Because we are sinners genetically. We are sinners because it's, we have been, sin has been passed on from generation to generation to generation. It's not a sociological thing. We are born sinners. 